Welcome to the Mark Steiner Show here on The Real News. I'm Mark Steiner. It's great to have you all with us once again. Today, I'll be talking with Dr. Tayer Ahmad. Dr. Ahmad joins us to discuss his recent experience volunteering at the Al Nasser Hospital in Khan Yunus in the Gaza Strip. He's an emergency room physician and assistant program director for the Advocate Christ Emergency Medicine Residency Program in Chicago. He recently returned from the Gaza Strip. So welcome, Dr. Ahmed, to the Mark Steiner Show. It's good to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And as we begin our conversation, I want to tell you some few things. That as of this day, on February the 20th, at least 28,775 Gazans have been killed. Among that number are at least 12,300 children. More than 7,000 missing, trapped under the rubble. 68,552 people injured, including at least 8,663 children. And in the West Bank, no less than 400 killed. More than 100 children among them. 4,500 wounded. And Gaza is being destroyed. Its infrastructure laid to waste. Over 360,000 homes have been destroyed. 1.7 million out of 2.3 million people displaced. Only 11 of 35 hospitals are functional, and those partially, barely. And all this was from the Al Jazeera live tracker on the Gaza war, which we'll link to. Now, before we start this conversation, there's some really graphic details that Dr. Ahmed and I will talk about. So be prepared for that as you talk to a man who just returned. So once again, Dr. Ahmed, welcome. I, I just wanted to set that up. But those stats, as horrendous as they sound, they can't even begin to touch the reality of what Gazans, Palestinians are experiencing on the ground, what you experienced on the ground. I mean, I think that's exactly right. I mean, these numbers are so astronomically hard, high, it's hard to conceptualize what they mean. I mean, you say 28,000 people, I mean, you can't even really visualize what that means. I mean, you can probably think about these, you know, sports stadiums being sold out and that many people have perished in this conflict. Mm. And I think one thing that you point out is, you know, this is about people who've been killed and wounded. Um, but when I experience firsthand being there is that it seems that every aspect of life in Gaza has come under attack, has been disrupted. I mean, there is nothing that you can think of in terms of everyday life that has not been totally altered and disrupted. You know, everything from school and uh, being able to go to work, being able to take you know public transportation, moving from the north to the south, every single aspect of life is is totally disrupted. So, talk about when you first, I mean, this is not your first time in Gaza, correct? Yeah, it's my fifth time. Fifth time. And you're going as a physician. Correct, yeah. So uh, talk a bit about how this particular journey is different than the others, from what you've seen from your first time in Gaza to, to now. I mean, it, it must have been, in some ways, just so deeply shocking, even even for you, an emergency physician who sees pain right. and suffering and blood every day. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. It's and nothing, nothing in my training. I mean, I trained in Detroit. I work in Chicago. I work at. I worked and trained in trauma centers. I work in. Uh, one of the busiest trauma centers in the entire country. Nothing had prepared me for what uh, I was about to see. And also my previous trips, um, this is on something on a totally different scale. I think something that we probably um, knew it was going to be different is, you know, after October 7th, nobody was getting in, nothing was getting out. And it took until the end of December for the first medical delegation, an international NGO medical delegation to get into the Gaza Strip at the end of December, you know, and so I was a part of the second delegation of healthcare providers that was able to get in in the beginning of January. And the thing that hits you right away is, you know, you land in Cairo, you're working with the World Health Organization, they're putting together these emergency medical teams. And as you embark on this journey to get to the Rafah border between uh, Gaza and Egypt, you start seeing these lines and lines of humanitarian trucks just parked on the side of the road. I mean, the queue is so long and you start to realize, OK, this is where this backup is. This is, you know, it's real. The the lack of aid getting in. You get to the border. Nobody's there. I mean, I had been to this Egyptian border before. It's pretty it's pretty busy. I mean, it's people moving in and out of Gaza, stuff coming in, mm -hmm. uh, commercial items, families. And it was empty. I'd shown up at around 2 p.m. And all, you know, there was five Egyptian border patrol on the, during the, like the passport control side of this. I mean, no one is there. It was just me and a group of 
um, like 30 or 40 uh, NGO workers with, uh, you know, seven or eight physicians who are ready to get into work. And so, you know, everything was different about this. Everything about this trip was nothing that I had seen before. The second you cross over into the Palestinian side of Rafah, there's no electricity. I mean, like even their passport control had, there was no lights there. There was no, uh, you know, there was no power that you can kind of grab your uh, your luggage off of the rack. I mean, right away, you're you're just struck by the, the difference um, once you cross the border. And, you know, we were, we grabbed our stuff. We showed up. It was sunset. We hop in a van and uh, it's tent city in Rafah. I had been in Rafah before. And this town is, you know, a r very rural town, 250,000 people. And when we were there, it had already started to, you know, surpass a million people. And you can immediately feel the crowded nature of everything. These makeshift tents being set up everywhere in this rural town and no lights anywhere in the middle of the night, just kind of people uh, moving about and the headlights of our van just kind of exposing what we, you know, what we could see. I mean, when, when I hear your description and, and when I've seen the photos and the, and, and the film and talked to some other people, people really can't grasp that this is a dystopian nightmare. Mm -hmm. I mean... Mm -hmm. It's it's not. I don't know how to even say this. Sometimes it's not even like a. It's not even like a regular war, right? Right. Yeah. You know, I had asked that. I had I had asked that question, and I had suspected this. I'm Palestinian, but I'm from the West Bank, and you know, our community here in the states has been glued to the coverage. Yeah. And you know, we thought we were. Uh, you know, I thought I was informed about what was going on, but then when I cross over and I'm talking to every single person who can who has some story of how their life has been permanently altered forever, whether it's their home has been destroyed, they've been displaced five times, they've lost family members, you know, they every single part of their life has been altered permanently. It really started to overwhelm me. And I remember asking the uh, World Health Organization representative, he had said this phrase to me, and this is, I had thought this, but I also know my own personal bias. I know like my own background. He said, this is the worst humanitarian crisis since World War II. And I had been to Syria. Um, I've been to Turkey after the the earthquake. I've been in Jordan with the Syrian refugees. In Europe with the refugee crisis. Um, so I've, you know, we've in my the organization Med Global has been in Yemen and Sudan and the the south of the border and Venezuela. And so I asked him. I said, "Why do you say that? What makes you come to that conclusion?" And he said, and he pu he literally pulled out the map that was in front of him of the Gaza Strip. He said, "It's 25 miles long. You've got 2.3 million people here." In every other conflict, there was at least this a place that they could flee. He said, here, we're forcing them to stay in this very confined area, and it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And he said, that's one part of this. There's a war going on, bombs being dropped, people being killed. He goes, that's part of the humanitarian nightmare. The second part of this is we're not letting them out, of course, but we're not letting anything in. He goes, nothing, no food, no water, no fuel. He goes, you are literally not addressing the things that they need to stay alive. He said, you know, you hear about a um, 100 trucks a day entering. He said, this is a joke in terms of what is needed. He said, if pre-war they needed 500 trucks of humanitarian aid of uh, different water or food sources or fuel. He goes, and now you've reduced it to 100 during the height of an intense bombing campaign. He said, you're not addressing their needs. And he said, with all of that taking place, it took, he said, this war is happening in a place that already was very dependent on humanitarian aid, very dependent on international NGOs providing public services. He goes, so when you start addressing, when you start looking at Gaza, it's pretty easy to come to that conclusion. It's the deaths, it's people being wounded, but it's the children that are dying. Children who yeah. are suffering from malnutrition, who are dying every day because there's no food to eat. Yeah, it's so, I mean, children are so disproportionately affected by this. I mean, you're exactly right. Um, they are more likely to die from these bomb strikes um, that, you know, a house is collapsing. I mean, I witnessed that firsthand. You got a 25-year-old versus a five-year-old. Um, the 25 year old can sustain some of this blunt injury, some that force of a house kind of, you know, collapsing. They can survive that. These kids are coming in here and just that blow is what's killing them. And it's, you know, that's, it's, it's so tragic. I remember, you know, I, I was at Nasser hospital while it was still functional. And um, every single day you hear, um, you hear some intense bombing, you feel the hospital shake, uh, that blast wave, that I'm talking about, even if I'm 50 or 100 meters away, 
everybody in the hospital feels that wave go through their body. I mean, your ears feel like they close a little bit and you can kind of feel it being pushed in your chest. And I remember you'd wait 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and then suddenly the people are coming in. Their families are running to the hospital, carrying their loved ones or, you know, wrapping them in a, in a blanket from their house. And I remember one particular night, <clears throat> it was a family of 20 that had come in. Their house had been bombed. And um, out of the 26 are what we would call dead on arrival. So they had, you know, there was nothing for us to do. But three of those six were were young girls under the age of 12. Oh. And they just, their, their small bodies cannot survive the blast. And I mean, that's something that, you know, I that's something, you know, we, uh, you know, we, we, we would say to each other, it's just, you know, something we, we're going to have to live with for the rest of our lives. Not just those images, but these kids that are lost. I mean, you know, it's... It, everything that's happening in Gaza when it comes to kids is intensified. And so I talked about how they're not going to school. I talk about how they are so easily killed with these bombs, their bodies can't survive it. But you talked about the malnourishment and the hunger and the starvation. I mean, we're talking about an entire generation. It's not just about um, being hungry. It's how it's going to affect their lives forever. Their immune systems are weakened. Their growth will be stunted. Their coping mechanisms in terms of hunger is going to be different for the rest of their lives. I mean, this is, you know, it's it's just so jarring to think about um, the future for these kids. And I'll, I'll say one last thing. You know, before October 7th, there was uh, an organization that was looking at the mental health of children in the Gaza Strip. And they felt that 70% of kids who were under the age of 18 um, needed psychosocial support, counseling maybe, or just kind of some programs that would help them uh, adapt and adjust. That number now, I mean, uh, there's been no formal assessment, but I think everybody knows that that number is going to be all of the children in Gaza. In fact, all of the population in Gaza, their psychosocial needs are going to be intense. They're going to be high, and there's no way that we're going to be able to address it um, if things, if the status quo returns, I'll say. Before I come into some other issues here, I, I mean, you personally, you, you, you've you been to Al Nasser Hospital before this. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yep. Visited one. Yeah. So, I mean... Just what, what happens to you, to people like you, who go there to do the work you do, especially those of you who are Palestinian Americans or, or Palestinians who are coming in to try to help do what they can, to see the yeah. conditions walking in there, as opposed to yeah. what the hospital might have been like before. Um, I, yeah. I just, that also has its own level of post-traumatic stress for men, men and women like you. It's devastating, Mark. I mean, you know, we, our programs, like not just Med Global, the organization I work with, but there's the Palestinian American Medical Association, the Palestinian Children's Relief Fund. All these organizations, our focus for the last five, 10 years is about building local capacity. Um, my, I specifically was involved in training local healthcare workers and getting them the resources that they would need. Uh, you know, we were bringing in these portable ultrasound machines that they can use on patients and they can carry it around and you can connect it to an iPad or an iPhone. Uh, PAMA, the Palestinian American Medical Association, had built this million dollar interventional radiology suite at Shifa Hospital so that they can provide more services for people. So you don't need to transfer all of the Gazans out of uh, Gaza for healthcare needs and medical needs. And it's all about trying to build that capacity. To see it immediately reduced, like in four months, to be all of that work, not only to be to go back to zero, but to even go further back than that, to set the whole healthcare system back, to watch all of the work that's been done just erased. And, and I mean, it was devastating. And, you know, just talking to my colleagues there on the ground, people who had been a part of some of those programs, I mean, it was it was really depressing to have those conversations because, you know, one of the things that everybody knows about the Gaza Strip is there is a brain drain. I mean, there are so many bright people who uh, don't have the opportunities in the Gaza Strip that want to, you know, professionally develop themselves somewhere else. Doctors, engineers, um, architects, they want to continue their training. They want to further specialize. They want to become better. And so they already were leaving the Gaza Strip uh, because those opportunities weren't there. I think about the people that stayed, what's left for them now? I mean, what sort of programs can they participate in? I was there when they had um, totally uh, uh, charged, they, they set charges and they demolished one of the universities. There are no university buildings left, and, you know? And so, I mean, this is, you know, when I say like 360 degrees, like kind of this attack on life, I mean, I, it's, it's, I'm serious. I mean, like, 
you know, no universities left. Kids have not been going to school for four months. There are no public health services. None of these, you know, no, no progress that was made in the last 10 years exists anymore. Bring it back home for a moment, home to the United States for a minute. Yeah. Um, the, the question is, <laughs> the United States of America is literally the only country on the planet that can stop this madness. Right, yes, I agree. And nothing's happening. I mean, even as you wrote, and other, and other physicians have read and written, even the AMA will not come out with a statement saying this is ethnic cleansing, it's genocide, whatever term, term you want to use. I mean, uh, it's it's almost unfathomable. And, and, and how to push this country, how to push this administration to do something yeah. when nothing's being done at all. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the part of this, I think, that's um, a struggle for people who are a part of the diaspora. Um, the expectation was, okay, there are politics in the region. We understand the geopolitical forces that exist in the Middle East are very complicated. And I, honestly, you talk to anybody in the Middle East, they are very aware of this. I mean, they can tell you in detail kind of what's, you know, the, the things that are taking place. But I don't think anybody expected that there would be this lack of, of, and I think, I, I mean, I want to use the word empathy, but um, there's it's even less than that. There isn't even sort of an acknowledgement of the suffering. There is no sort of recognition that it's taking place. In fact, what we're finding is the opposite. Uh, when I talk to some of these medical professional societies, they there's there's these justifications for why you would raid and shut down the, the biggest hospital in the Gaza Strip, knowing that not only are people being treated there and that you have the most resources and the most specialists, but people are sheltering there too. Tens of thousands of people are thinking that, okay, the hospital compound will be safe. You're getting these sort of justifications. Here, I live in, in Chicago, Illinois, in a suburb that if you look on Google Maps, they call it Little Palestine from how many Palestinians live here. I mean, you can go down, the street is called Harlem. If you go down Harlem, you're seeing all of these different Palestinian-owned businesses. There's Arabic, there's Palestinian flags. Um, every single week they're protesting. But what they've been met with has been this consistent sort of dehumanization rhetoric that we hear from elected officials. Even our local congressmen here, when uh, they bring up, hey, at the time it was 20,000 had been killed. They say, hey, there's 20,000 dead, 70% of them are women and children. And the response you get is, well, you know, those numbers, I'm not sure. I, I think there's thousands and thousands of fighters in the, in those numbers. And you're like, well, I mean, so okay that these kids are dead? Is that okay then, that these kids have been killed or that they're wounded? I mean, you know, it's uh, it's been frustrating because whether it's a professional society, an elected official, or even a, a company or, an, or a corporation that can talk about, you know, we want the war to stop. We can't even get people to call for a ceasefire. I mean, we can't even get people to use those words. Um, and that's something that's been really frustrating for myself. It's been super disheartening because they're not, they don't even know what the, what their faces look like. I, I'll tell you one thing, Mark, I'd love to get, I'd love to hear what you have to say about this because there's this famous influencer online and he had said, um, you know, cause they talked about how many kids have been killed. He started questioning that number. He said, well, you know, when you're in a region like that over there, 15 years old is different than 15 years old here in the States. Those people can be, those people are trained and they can be military people and they can be fighting. You're like, what? A 15 year old? I mean, come on, we know how, you know, we can, we kind of know how dumb 15 year olds are, right? They're silly. They are running around. They don't know. They can't, you can't expect them to be making decisions for the rest of their lives. I mean, just to kind of dismiss it that way, I mean, was really, really frustrating to hear. But it's just, I mean, I don't know. It's dehumanization is real. It's like, you know, <laughs> it reminds me of how white people in America spoke about black kids in the inner city mm. as if 15 year olds were not 15 year olds. Mm. They were 35 year olds. Right. You know, I mean, it's the same, the same mentality that dehumanizes young black children or dehumanizing young Palestinian children, de dehumanizing Palestinians in general. Mm. I mean, it's, yeah. a, it's the same, it's the same dynamic. Right. Right. I mean, I think that's, uh, you know, one thing I remember is being at Aqsa Hospital in Deir al-Balah, which is the middle area. And it was right after basically the Israeli military had kind of sort of withdrawn their tanks and their ground troops. They were done with their campaign there and they were moving to Khan Yunus further south. And I remember being outside of the hospital compound and there were all these kids rushing to me and the general surgeon that was with me who's from Chicago. And they knew that we were not from there. So they were just asking a bunch of questions. And I remember them asking about seeing pictures of Chicago. And so we were showing them downtown Chicago, the skyline, and we were showing them some of the protests. And 
their mind was blown seeing people protesting in the streets of Chicago with Palestinian flags. It was surreal to them. They said, wow, there are people outside of here raising the flag of Palestine, talking about us like they know about us. They know about what's happening here. Wow. And, you know, that's that's why I get so angry when somebody tries to, you know, uh, not put a face to these kids. You know, you can hear their voices. They were so excited. They're laughing with each other, looking at the pictures. They're elbowing each other to get close to the iPhone so they can scroll <laughs> through the images, you know, so it's. You know, that's that's really the thing that bothered me the most. Like those these kids, you know, they've they I just want them to have the same sort of future uh, that anybody else does in the world. Same sort of opportunity to even visit here one day. I would hope that they can do that. You know, and it's just it's tough. Everything is working against them. Just for a moment, I want to come back to your experience at Al Nasser Hospital on this visit. Yeah. And for people to have an understanding who listen to our podcast here across the country and globe just how horrendous it was in that hospital, what it was like yeah. being in the midst of war, watching people. I mean, the, the, the cases you couldn't, you, the lives you could not save. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I mean, mean, when you're in an emergency room, something happens, a guy comes home from an accident, you can't save him, one person dies, you feel terrible, it's, it's a horrendous feeling. But this, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is multiplied by dozens and dozens and dozens. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly right. I mean, it's just nonstop. Um, the the volume is so high of people coming in. I remember walking in and right away, you can tell the difference from any visit before to Nasser Hospital. I mean, there's people sheltering in the hallways of the hospital, in the emergency department on the first, second, third, fourth floor. And I'm going into, we call this like the resuscitation area where you bring in the sickest people and you go through those double doors. It's about, you know, it's a not a very big room. It, it's actually probably the size of one private suite in the States in terms of a hospital room. That's how, that's the size of our resuscitation bay. Wow. Walk in there and there's 13 people there. Seven are on the floor, oh. you know, because we don't have enough hospital carts. And I remember being very overwhelmed at first, having to take some deep breaths because I'm like, where, who do I go to first? Who do I check on first from these people that just showed up um, from this, from this bombing? And, you know, it's, it's, it's the family that's bringing these people in most of the time, because as you, as I'm sure you're aware, it's not safe to be in an ambulance driving to some of these sites that have just been bombed trying to bring people back they are they are very much uh, a target as well so many ambulances and paramedics have been uh, killed in this in this conflict so it's the it's the dad uh, bringing in you know his son or his daughter it's uh it's four brothers bringing in their fifth brother in a in a family blanket and they're dropping them off and you've got to quickly sort of assess what's happening and you know in a trauma situation a mass casualty event the horrible reality that you have to deal with is you have to decide, okay, what is going to be, who is dead already? Many of them will be dead already. Who is still alive and the walking wounded? Can I ignore them for a couple of minutes? Will they be okay if I ignore them? Who has a really severe injury that I should do something about? And then who has a really severe injury that's not survivable? And you know, I'll share one situation that Please. still really, really struggles. Uh, you know, I still have a, a decent amount of uh, issues kind of processing this. But I remember there was a kid who came in probably five or six years old. And um, they had been hit and shrapnel had just totally destroyed their body. But they were still alive. Eyes were open, breathing very, very fast. But their skull had been damaged. Mm. And some of their brain was exposed. Mm. You know, I'm sorry for being so graphic. But... It's, um, you know, uh, the neurosurgeon who was there um, told me, he's like, you know, this is not a good sign and probably we should consider, you know, not sort of being aggressive with our management here. And I struggled with that because I'm looking at this kid and his eyes are still open. He's not he's not there. He's clearly totally his his level of consciousness is not there. He's not aware of his surroundings, but his eyes are open and he's breathing fast. And I'm just staring at him. It's like, you know, I, I didn't know how to go about that. And so we did, I mean, we basically tried to do everything we could. And, you know, we basically put him on a ventilator. We took him to the operating room. He came out, uh, but the neurosurgeon was exactly right. I mean, the next day this kid succumbed to his injuries and, you know, he, he, uh, he had died, but, you know, you're looking at somebody kind of their last moments like that, you know, and you're just like, you. there was plenty of moments where we had to make that decision where we're not going to be able to do anything because it's not going to work. And you've got to move on to the next person. 
uh, that's not a normal situation to be in. It, we sometimes, you know, that might happen once in a blue moon for a mass casualty event in the States. But to do that every day um, mm -hmm. or every other day and to see that multiple times, uh, that's something that I worry about my colleagues over there who've had to do that for four months. You know? so, yeah. How long were you there when you were there this last time? Three weeks. Three yeah. weeks. And I was at Nasser Hospital, sleeping at Nasser Hospital. We were there, you know, around the clock. And actually, right before I left, it, um, the the last week that I was there is when the military started to um, surround the complex. And so everybody there, including the staff, told me exactly what was going to unfold. They said, this is what happened at Shifa. This is how it starts. You're They're at the perimeter of the hospital. There's bombings nearby. Um, there's tank shelling. Um, and there's, uh, you know, they want the internally displaced people who are sheltering around the hospital. They want to clear that whole area. They want them out of there. And, you know, week by week, day by day, everything they said was true. And it all culminated in this last four or five days where the hospital was shut down, the electricity was turned off, it was stormed, uh, dozens and dozens of people were arrested, some were killed, and then everybody else had to evacuate the hospital. Do you know what the situation is now? Yeah, like I just a... actually, sorry, uh, I, I just got a message from Dr. Khaled. He's the last, he's one of the last remaining trauma surgeons at Nasser Hospital. We, um, he shared a message with us about two hours ago. He said, the electricity's still out. The WHO has visited the hospital. They were able to transport 13 people out. There's another uh, 10 that need uh, tr uh, transfer immediately. And um, he's among 10 uh, medical staff and there's probably 200 people still there and he's saying this is not a it's not a hospital anymore it's just a building um with with people who have a tough time leaving uh, uh stuck in it you know i mean there's so many bed bound patients there um people with ampute amputations and um, people who are not going to be able to make a five mile six mile walk to rafah um and he said you know the the he said um, there are still some doctors who have been arrested uh, or abducted and um, are in Israeli custody somewhere. That they're, they're not sure, um, but that he expects um, that the hospital will be empty in the next, uh, you know, two days or so. And he's appealing. He, of course, I mean, this is the type of people that we're talking about there. But he is begging for the hospital not to be shut down so that they can continue to treat patients. I mean, this guy just underwent a seven-day siege watched an operating room nurse get shot in the chest and had to perform uh, surgery. And he's saying, I don't want to leave the hospital. I don't want the hospital to shut down. Please talk to whoever you can talk to to get the lights back on and to get us some supplies so we can keep doing our work. And as horrible as it sounds, these are the stories that America needs to hear. Yeah, yeah, I agree. That guy's amazing. This guy, Dr. Khaled, he's among all these different people that I worked with. Mark, these guys are amazing. I mean, they're work, they work these 24-hour shifts, which in a busy ER setting, trauma setting, is crazy to do. They work these 24-hour shifts. They'll be off for 24 hours. They're sleeping in the hospital. Their families are intense. And these guys are amazing at their job. I've not seen clinicians like that ever in my life. I mean, they know how to do a lot with a little. And they are, they are working with no salary for four and a half months. Dr. Khal, all these people are totally dependent on the aid that's being distributed by NGOs. And I, I remember hearing them talk to, you know, talk to their family, asking, did we get a, did they disperse today? Did they, uh, was there some, you know, was there any sort of flower oh. that got sent out? I mean, these are, and these are people who have to work 24 hours. You're expecting them to be, you know, to be able to function at a high level. So, I mean, they're amazing people. And, but they, I mean, the situation that they're in, it's just, it's brutal. It's miserable. So let let me take it back home with you for a moment. The time we have left together, but, but what can be done here? I mean, look. Sometimes people won't listen to you because you're Palestinian American. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people won't listen to me because I'm a Jewish American, and they think right. I'm a traitor. <laughs> okay. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, but all that aside, I mean, the, with, uh, I'm I, I'm curious about what is around you, what people are talking about, what you're doing in terms of organizing and working with people to change the, the nature of the dialogue in this country and, and, to, and to push this country to do what has to be done. I mean, my biggest focus has been on com combating the dehumanization narrative, putting a face behind what's happening to the people over there, the numbers of people that are being killed, trying to at least communicate who these people are. Now, whether that's me writing an op-ed or me coming on your program or 
uh, uh, members of the largest union in Illinois calling for a ceasefire. Um, the AFL-CIO came out, called for a ceasefire. I'm trying to get the American Medical Association to at least comment on the humanitarian catastrophe. We've met with our senators here dozens of times just as a you know just as a community of conscience made up of you know muslims arabs palestinians jews christians just people of conscience you know people who uh care about other human beings and want to alleviate suffering um i've also talked about this and i think this is super important i actually learned this from uh, a colleague of mine whose grandfather survived the Holocaust. And I thought this was such an important point. It's that anytime something happens to a people, it's important to document it for the historical record in any way that you can. Whether if you're an architect and you want to describe um, what architecture looks like under occupation in the West Bank, or you want to talk, or you're a healthcare provider like myself and you want to describe how a healthcare system collapsed so easily within, you know, a couple of weeks of a war breaking out. What are the circumstances? Or it's art, you know, I mean, or it's just somebody trying to paint a mural of that six-year-old that was um, left to die, uh, Hind Rajab, who, you know, was in a car with her family and everybody in the, in the car dies and she survives and she has the phone and she calls a dispatcher. And so we have the, we have that, like, uh, that recording for, you know, three hours between her and a dispatcher as she's waiting for someone to rescue her and ultimately they find her dead. Somebody painting a mural of her, just kind of honoring her story, making sure nobody forgets about that. I think that stuff is so important because at the end of the day, I recognize that there will always be differences and ideas about how policy should be centered or written or I understand that. But I know for sure that every single human being can feel the pain of a child crying, like, you know, that that pain of hearing a child in distress. I know every human being can relate to that. I know every single human being can understand the loss of a loved one, whether it's a father or a grandfather. Everybody understands what it's like to, you know, maybe uh, uh, have a job. But what if you lost that job? You can imagine that. So imagine that for the Palestinians that are there. Imagine kind of the disaster that they're encountering. We can we can put ourselves in their shoes. I think that's that's the strongest thing we can do right now. That's very powerfully said. So uh, I, 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 are you planning on going back? Yeah, I mean, I had some difficulty getting out. Um, I think as a Palestinian American, it's clear that there is um, some issues being from the West Bank and trying to get into the Gaza Strip. My plan is my plan was to go back in April. Um, I hope that I can go back and it's going to be a ceasefire so we can get to work for the the long term struggles that we're going to encounter. Um, but we're working on that. I'm not going to, you know, I, I was told this time that there may be issues getting out and it was it was really hard getting out. But I don't, that's not going to deter. What do you mean it was hard getting out? What happened? Yeah. So I'll give you this. Uh, so every single day in the Gaza Strip at 9 a.m., the Israelis produce a list of people who will be permitted to leave from the Gaza Strip into Egypt. That list is shared with the Egyptians, and then the Egyptians share that list with the Palestinians. Uh, what I was told as we were entering is that my my name is not going to show up on that list when I show up to the border. I'm not going to be allowed to leave. And so I had worked with uh, State Department officials, my congressmen, senators, just to kind of be able to make sure that I can uh, securely get out. When we showed up that morning trying to leave, um, it was true that my name was not on that list. Um, if I was any other person, if I didn't have an American citizenship, if I was just your regular Palestinian who's not a dual citizen, I would not be permitted to leave unless I had 13,000 US dollars on me to pay off the people um, on the Egyptian border to let me go. Um, so that was kind of, I think, essentially, um, my difficulty was, uh, that small difficulty that I endured is what is just what Palestinians have to face, right? It's like being Palestinian, there is a siege in place here. We really want to restrict people leaving. And so that's kind of what I uh, was, that, that I experienced on a minor level. Hey, let me just say that, um, I want to thank you for showing your own bravery going into that war and doing the work that you did and the other physicians and other people in there doing what they can to help defend and heal the people who are hurt, wounded. Uh, it, it's it's amazing. It's, it's not everybody can do that. Um, and we will keep the doors open here for you and all others to tell the stories so we can hear it. And you've actually inspired me today to think about some creative ways to do this through some of the ideas you have. So <laughs> I, I appreciate that. And I, and uh, thank you so much for your work. Uh, and we will all keep pushing this because I want to just say, this is not who we are as Jews. This is not who we are as Americans. This is not who we are as people. We cannot allow this to happen. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tara Ahmed. Thank you so much for joining us today. Look forward to staying in touch and uh, take care of yourself. Take care. Likewise. 
Once again, I want to thank Dr. Thayer Ahmad for joining us today and for the work he did in Gaza and the work he'll do again in Gaza and all the men and women who were there doing the work that he was doing there. And we'll link to their work here on our site. And we'll continue our reporting on the Gazan War of Annihilation here at The Real News. And once again, thank you all for joining us today. Please let me know what you thought. And thanks to David Hebden for running the show and editing this program and the tireless Kelly Rivara making it all work behind the scenes and everyone here at The Real News for making this show possible. As I said, we'll link to the work of Dr. Ahmad and others in his group on our site here at The Real News. And let me know what you thought of what you heard today, what you'd like us to cover. Just write to me at mss at therealnews.com and I will write to you immediately. And stay tuned for more conversations and stories about Palestine and Israel here on The Real News from all of us and on The Steiner Show. So for the crew here at The Real News, I'm Mark Steiner. Stand wild. Keep listening. And take care. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.